Good evening, distinguished guests, students, faculty. On behalf of the Master's of Science and Foreign Service program, let me welcome you to this evening's conversation. My name is Nicole Bibbin Sadaka, and I have the great honor and pleasure of both being an alumna as well as a professor at the MSFS. It would not surprise any of you if I were to say we are living in extraordinarily difficult times, complex times with many challenges. And the solutions to those challenges will not be easy and will not be picked out of a theory or picked out of a textbook. It will require a deep understanding of history, of culture, of politics, economics, foreign policy, but it will also require creativity and innovation. It will require strong ethical leaders with a heart for service who have the tenacity and boldness to lead us through difficult times. At MSFS, we have four core values, leadership, ethics, service, and creativity that we seek to instill in our students for exactly that reason, because those are the values that they need to go out and change the world. We also seek to have around us partners and faculty members who have lived and embodied these values. And we are so fortunate this year to have as one of our faculty members, Admiral John Kirby, who not only teaches our students what these values mean in the context of US national security and communications, but he has lived them in his long public service career. He served in the United States Navy for three decades, and then went on to be the spokesperson for the Pentagon and for the US Department of State. He's a familiar face to many, as he is currently serving as one of CNN's military and diplomatic analysts. Admiral Kirby this evening will be in a conversation with our featured and distinguished guest, former United States Secretary of State John F. Kerry. Secretary Kerry serves as the 68th Secretary of State of the United States from 2013 to 2017. And as our top diplomat, he led the United States through many difficult foreign policy issues, from the Iran nuclear deal, to climate change, to the US response to the Syrian conflict. He came to that top diplomacy position from years in the Senate five terms as a senator from Massachusetts from 1985 to 2013, where he also dealt as the head, the uh, chairman of the Committee on Foreign Relations with the similar pressing foreign policy issues. So from these two perches, he has watched and led our nation in many ways over that time. His recent book, Every Day is Extra, is a memoir detailing his eyewitness accounts of how these events have unfolded. And so we are so fortunate to have two public servants today with us in conversation with each other and in conversation with our students and faculty about what is happening in the world today. Please join me in welcoming Admiral John Kirby and Secretary John Kerry. Thank you very much. Thank you for an extraordinarily joy generous uh, warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank Admiral, you. it's all yours. <laughs> I spent my time working for you um, When I was a lieutenant, I got to tell you, when I was a lieutenant in the Navy when I first went in, I was terrified of these guys. Admirals, <laughs> they quake when you were near them. You tried to avoid them. So did I, sir. <laughs> I was, no one was more surprised than me that I made Admiral, let me tell you that. Um, sir, I'm going to start by just asking you some questions, most of them based on the book and the lessons that the book uh, teaches us all. It's a terrific read. Um, and we'll do that for about 30 minutes and then open it up. Um, I'd like to start with this idea that you've led a life that was, in a sense, bookended by conflict, by war. I was struck that uh, you, recount, you recount one of your earliest memories, which is the crunch of broken glass under your feet as you walk through the rubble of your mother's hometown in France, which had been almost completely destroyed in World War II. You ended your time as Secretary of State working desperately to end the bloodshed in Syria. Uh, and you said yourself, many times I heard you say, that your experience in Vietnam definitely shaped the way you approach diplomacy. So if you could walk us through what you meant by that 
And, and what lessons may we draw from mankind's capacity for war uh, that might help us make peace a little less elusive? Thank you, John, for a small, tiny question. <laughs> I love it. Um, can I just say to everybody here, first of all, uh, I'm really delighted to be here at Georgetown. I live just down the street. You all come by, particularly on Halloween, scary as hell. Uh, and, um, and I love Gaston Hall. I've had a number of events here running for president as a senator and as secretary of state. And I thank Georgetown uh, and Dr. Joya and everybody for their always generous welcome. And rarely do you get to sit in as, as, as beautiful a place as this to talk about things that aren't so beautiful on the outside so uh, we can be inspired just by our place. Secondly, point of personal privilege, I want to say thank you. Uh, there are two special friends here. There are more than that, but I just want to introduce quickly. Linda Thomas-Greenfield uh, was the Director General of the State Department, which is a lofty and important oversight of the, all the workings of the department. And I twisted her arm like crazy to give up the comfort of that position back in Washington and so forth, no travel, unless she wanted to, to become the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. And I just want to thank her for that selfless act. And thank you. And, uh, stand up. And, and sitting to her left is, is a gentleman who I came to see uh, as one of our great, very skilled diplomats. And it takes years to build that skill. Um, and it's sad that people of great skill have seen fit to have to leave the department over the course of these last couple of years. But Jeff De Laurentiis was our head of our interest section down in uh, Cuba. And um, by the way, I learned when I went down there that the house happens to be one of the top five houses we have anywhere in the world. So it was not a hardship post in that sense, folks. <laughs> but please, uh, everybody thank Jeff for managing uh, Cuba. So, to his simple question, um, <laughs> I was four years old, 1947, uh, born obviously during World War II, and it's a little strange to say, well, my mother's home in France, why, what was going on? My mother was the daughter of uh, an old Boston family, uh, and she, her, her father, my grandfather, was an international businessman, and he was, a, he was working in France and Britain, and they were living there during the raging 1920s, great period of time to read about American expatriates. You have undoubtedly read the works of some of them, like Ernest Hemingway, and you all know Gertrude Stein and others. So there was this great crowd of people who lived abroad during much of that period, and have written about it. Um, my grandfather, uh, <laughs> You know, they were living in between England and France, and there were 11 members of my mother's family. My mother was right in the middle. And they had this home that he had as a summer place, which was really beautiful, and out on a promontory. And the Germans took it over in 1930. And my mother trained to be a nurse because she saw the war coming. And as an American, she, she still felt a sense of responsibility. So she was working in Montparnasse, the train station in Paris, taking care of refugees. And then they learned one night the Germans are about to march in. And when she heard that, she and her sister and her sister's new husband, a French painter, and a friend grabbed their bicycles and left Paris and foraged their way across France, got to Portugal. And she made her way to the United States where she married my father, who she knew previously from being in France. But she took me over because she was this house place was so important to her and she wanted to go back after the war and see what had happened because she heard the germans had bombed it and burned it as they left because our family knew churchill and so um i was walking through this rubble with her holding her hand as a four-year-old kid she was crying i didn't know why i was disturbed by that but then i heard the glass crunching under my feet and i looked to my right and i saw this stairway going up into the sky and nothing else around it. 
And then I saw uh, the chimney going up in the sky there in the house. And it just stayed with me. I mean, an, a, an impression like that's pretty indelible. A few years later, we were back over there. My dad when it was, went into the Foreign Service when John Foster Dulles did the great expansion of the Foreign Service in the early 1950s, 1952 or so. And uh, I went back, and I remember seeing the detritus of war. Those of you who have seen Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan, get a little bit of the sense of what that beach was like. But I have always been in awe of that beach uh, from the time I was a kid and saw the Higgins boats and the, uh, and, and the, the consequences of war. I mean, I had an aunt who was interned in Vichy, France uh, because of her efforts to save Jews and get them out and so forth. And it was tough. I mean, people were lost. My, my, one of my aunts lost her husband, a pilot, um, and, and I felt always the folklore of that period hit me. That's number one. So then my dad also volunteered to be in the Army Air Corps right out of Harvard Law School and uh, was one of the earliest volunteer cadets in the then, you know, not yet Air Force, but the Army Air Corps, flying DC-3s, paratroopers, et cetera. So um, I also grew up, therefore, were the greatest generation parents, people who had a sense of responsibility about service to country, and also grew up imbued with language that originally comes from the scriptures, but which has been quoted by a number of presidents and others, of those to whom much is given, much is expected. And that was our, that was our sort of ethos of the time, if you will, which we grew up with. So I went, uh, uh, yeah, I went to parochial school. To a, I'm a Catholic, but I went to Episcopal school, um, and loved their hymns. I sang them all, <laughs> and uh, and so I have a fair amount of ecumenicism in me. I was just imbued by virtue of that experience. But uh, when we were undergraduates, my freshman year, we almost went to war with the Soviet Union over Cuba. My sophomore year, I was sitting on the bench. I was a soccer player. We were playing Harvard, Harvard-Yale game, weekend, Friday. Uh, and I was substituted and came off the bench and suddenly heard this ripple through the crowd. The president's been shot. The president's been shot. And I'd met the president. You, in my book, you see a picture of me sailing with the president at age uh, 18. And, um, the ripple turned into the president is dead. He's been assassinated in Dallas. And so we, all of us were, needless to say, deeply moved and concerned by that and the events that followed, the live shooting on television of Lee Harvey Oswald by Jack Ruby. Um, and, and from there, into junior year, when many of us became involved in the civil rights movement with the knowledge and determination that we had to end Jim Crow in this country. Uh, we sent Freedom Ride buses down to the South for people to register people to vote, to break the back of Jim Crow. And um, then senior year, Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson asked for 500,000 additional troops to go over to Vietnam. Uh, in response to the very complicated Gulf of Tonkin incident, which didn't really merit 500,000 additional troops, but it was bigger than that. It was a proxy war. It was a war between the United States and communism and China and Russia. And so war, you know, war has been part of my life from the time I was four till I visited the beaches till, and I played in German bunkers as a kid. I used to play in these bunkers. Um, and then uh, in 1965, in response to Lyndon Johnson's call, before the first draft guards were burned, before we had descended into this cultural revolution and, and substantive re revolution, um, in 1965, I raised my right hand and swore I'd uphold the Constitution and went into the Naval Reserve. Um, by 66, when I graduated, 
We still weren't morally opposed to the war. We had questions about policy, and I gave a speech at Yale on class day, raising the questions of that policy. But um, by 66 summer, I was in uniform. I was in OCS, Officers Candidate School. By 67, I was in my first duty station at Treasure Island, San Francisco, where I was training for Nuclear Chemical Biological Warfare School and Damage Control School. And I got to tell you that the summer of love in 1967 in San Francisco was really hard duty, folks. Um, you have to go back and read, read the history of that period of time. It was a remarkable transformation in America. I used to get, I mean, I went to the Fillmore West. I, I, I saw the Rolling Stones live, the Grateful Dead live. I know I'm dating some things here, guys, but I still look pretty young. I'm OK. I'm, um, and I still listen to them, too, uh, and a lot of other people. Uh, if you ever have a chance, any of you here, I urge you to go visit the cemetery at, at Colville-sur-Mer in France. It is American land. It is deeded to the United States. And if you ever want to understand why you have a responsibility, even as a student, and why we need to rescue our democracy in the name of those people who gave their lives for it, that's the visit to make. What those guys did there is extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, we were always shot at. Uh, we were always shot at first. We were riding in these 50-foot gunboats up the rivers of the Mekong Delta. And the rivers were not as wide as this room, more often than not. Uh, so the mangrove along the side became the cover for the Viet Cong, and they'd fire their rockets and their machine guns, and we'd take our wounded and usually try to get out of there. But we changed that tactic at a point in time and started to charge the beach and overran the ambushes. But it was, kind of, it was crazy in itself. But, but the point I'm trying to make to you is that that was nothing, nothing in my judgment because we never knew when we were going to get hit. You know, you kind of have this sense of invincibility, and you go up the river, and boom, it happens. But you're not looking at the gun. You're not looking at the guys who are going to kill you. They were, on that day, approaching that beach with these fortresses of concrete above them, with artillery and, and, and mortars and machine guns of the highest caliber and everything, arrayed in a long row, and they see a boat that's one moment going alongside them, the next moment is blown into the sky and everybody's gone. And when your door dropped and it was time to run up on that beach, uh, you knew you may have only seconds, if that. And lieutenants fell, and captains fell, and sergeants fell. Amazing. Uh, you have to read about it to understand it. And the Pacific, Tarawa and other places. So the, the point I'm trying to make to you is, I'm not going to go through all of the, but, but I want you to feel the sacrifices that have been made and, and why it is important to love our democracy, which means nurturing it, to care for it. Our democracy is in trouble as we gather here at Gaston Hall today and as we're involved in what we're, we're seeing. It's in trouble. Why? Because there's an absence of leadership that is prepared to hold people accountable to uphold their oath of office and to do the things they're supposed to do. And it's not that the Senate has, has changed so dramatically in terms of the rules. It's that the people have changed. And you know, I came to the Senate under Ronald Reagan in 1984. I was elected in 85. I went to the Senate. We could work across the aisle. We could get things done. We made compromises. We didn't yet have the folks there who held you to an ideological orthodoxy where they murder you in your own caucus if you step out and try to be independent or do something with other people. And so we actually worked together. I forged a strong friendship with John McCain. We'll get to it later. But I just come back to John's profoundly important question, which is the impact of war on my life and on the things I chose to do. Every day is extra is a statement that we who came back from those boats and from the rivers would say to each other. Because we were lucky enough to make it back, and a lot of people weren't. 
and we felt a sense of responsibility and a sense of, of duty to live a life of purpose in honor of those who had laid down their lives, and more so, because every day is extra. And you learn that in war. Here today, gone tomorrow, you just, it becomes so listed. If you're lucky enough to come back and get married and have a family and have children and go on and have a career, every day you got was extra compared to the others. And um, it is not, as some have suggested, a representation every day is extra of what Donald Trump thought when Bob Mueller was appointed, um, that every day is extra. Um, that has been suggested. It was not the purpose of the title, I assure you. Um, so I, I don't say this to you in any kind of overbearing and uh, certainly no arrogant way. I say it to you with a lot of humility, but I say it to you really earnestly that, that our democracy right now is not working. We're not making decisions. We're not making big decisions. I can't, you know, I'm not gonna go in, maybe we'll talk about it a little more in a minute, but you know, we have to get the gargantuan sums of money that are robbing the gender from the average person in this country. We've gotta get it out of American politics so average folks have their voices heard as much as the big lobbyists and the money people. We have to get, we have to get gerrymandering out so you can have a legitimate, and this should be so, so obvious, but we have Supreme Court struggles. That's why this fight over Kavanaugh is so important, but, but think about it. You can't have a genuine democratic election in the United States of America in November in many, many places because the districts have been carved up in a way that absolutely deprives you of a general election race, which is why so many people up on the Hill are terrified of being primaried. And primarying has become a weapon in the ideological orthodoxy enforcement structure. So uh, we have to figure out, and, and I'll tell you there is a way to do it, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. Well, actually, that's a great segue, sir. Let's stay on politics. Uh, you have a chapter in the book called The Old Senate. You talk about some of those qualities of bipartisanship, reaching across the aisle, the impact of World War II veterans on civility and discourse in the Senate. We now have a record number of women running for the, in the midterms, as well as a record number of veterans. Yeah. Uh, and many are female veterans. What do you think they can bring to the halls of Congress? And what do you think, uh, from your time in the Senate, what lessons can be learned and applied to help these new members uh, get to a better sense of bipartisanship and real progress on legislative priorities? Well, look, this is pretty simple, folks. Uh, I've said this many times uh, for years. Uh, uh, women represent 51, 52% of our nation. I don't know any team that can ever be successful if half your players are on the bench. We got we to, you know, we still have ceilings to break, glass or otherwise. I have two daughters, wonderfully empowered, beautiful daughters. One's a physician, the other's in uh, film and arts. Um, and they've grown into strong young women. But, you know, the difference Title IX made, I mean, they played athletics in college and they had equal facilities to men. That was Title IX. That wasn't so long ago. But I, I don't know where this Kavanaugh thing is going to take us. Uh, I fear, and I said this last night on Brian Williams, that the way this process has played out is so dangerous for the institution, for the future. You can't just think about the present the way they are. And there's no excuse. If you hold Merrick Garland hostage for 14 months and don't give him a hearing, let alone give him a meeting, the courtesy of a meeting, and then you have to vote within a week, within two weeks, when you know there are people out there who are raising issues that deserve to be heard. Not, not to mention a primary witness who was in the room allegedly, allegedly, uh, you at least have to talk to that person and they weren't planning to. That's just shocking to me. And that represents the failure of what I'm talking about. It's a failure of moral responsibility in the performance of your job. And what's happened today is, sadly, we have people who are more beholden to protect their power, party, and president than they are to uphold their oath of office, the Constitution, and to protect the institution in which they serve. That's 
just plain wrong under any circumstance whatsoever. So what can, I mean, it is a known fact, there are many studies that have been made that where women are engaged in uh, negotiations, when they're engaged in peace processes, when they are engaged in the running of an organization, uh, there often is, I'm not saying exclusively, but often is a different approach, less combative, less, uh, less uh, warrior-oriented, a little more reasonable at times and so forth. And, you know, my wife used to always say, you know, women have a special trait because women are generally the caretakers and the family, you know, organizers in so many ways. And so there is a different background there. When I came to the United States Senate, I had as many daughters as there were women senators in the Senate, too. And one of them was beaten in the next race, Paula Hawkins from Florida. So it took a while before we got up to the numbers that we have today. We're not where we are. We need to have at least 50% or close to it. And it shouldn't be done on a pure percentage basis. It shouldn't be done on a, on a you know, calculated gender basis. It should be done because it happens naturally because people have equal opportunities, equal pay, uh, and equal protection under the law. And I think it's something that people, I hope, are gonna be far more sensitive to after the vagaries of this process we've just been dragged through. Let me switch to climate change uh, for just a, a little bit. You, for your entire adult life, have been a staunch advocate of the environment. I watched you uh, personally work so hard to get us into the Paris Agreement. I saw the backroom negotiations you did to get us to that culmination, and you've been very vocal um, about your concerns now that the Trump administration has decided not to abide by the requirements set forth, the voluntary requirements set forth in, in the Paris Agreement. But you've also talked a lot, and sir, you did this even before we had the agreement, you talked a lot about the responsibilities that local communities, that corporations, states, our states have in helping us meet some of those targets. Are they doing enough? Do you get the sense from the people that you're still in touch with um, that that process is moving forward despite the federal no. government's decision to pull Okay, I'm, I'm delighted you asked this question, and I really want to spend a minute or two on this with you here, folks, because it's so hard to convey fully uh, the seriousness of this moment. Uh, unfortunately, the, you know, if you take a poll of people, if you walked out there right now and you did 50 people on the campus and you asked them what are the 10 biggest issues, uh, it's unlikely that climate change would show up in, you know, I guarantee it would show up in a majority, but it would not show up in many cases, because everybody, health care, getting, paying for my education, you know, security, and you run the list. Uh, getting a decent job, being able to be paid for the way, blah, blah, blah. You, 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 you know what I'm talking about. So I became involved in this when I first went to the Senate. I'd been a lieutenant governor who had dealt with acid rain as lieutenant governor. I was chair of a governor's task force, and I put together the effort that came up with the acid rain uh, the amendment that we passed ultimately that solved the acid rain problem. You don't hear about it now. Um, and Al Gore and I and a senator from Colorado, Tim Wirth, and senator from New Jersey, Frank Lautenberg, and John Chafee from Rhode Island, a Republican, uh, and uh, others went to Rio for the first Earth Summit, for the first global summit on this. And we came up with a voluntary mechanism in 1992 for dealing with climate. The problem is it was voluntary. Most countries didn't take it seriously. Not everybody knew what it was all about. So we went through many, many negotiations. Ultimately, Kyoto, where we had a mandatory structure pulled together. But we couldn't get a mandatory structure through the Senate because the coal states and oil and gas states refused to sign up for something mandatory in terms of reductions. So here we are in 2018. We, we, um, when, when I became Secretary of State, within, within six weeks, I think, of being Secretary, I went to China in, and, and had told my staff, I want to get the Chinese to change the position they had in Copenhagen four years earlier when they killed the conference and nothing happened on climate. I said, we cannot go forward with China leading the G77, the 77 underdeveloped countries of the world. So I went to Beijing, I negotiated with President Xi and uh, the rest of the Politburo and leaders, and we got them to agree for the first time 
that they would create a working group with the United States and we would work together to figure out how we could cooperate to try to lead the world to Paris to get the Paris Agreement. One year later, President Obama was able to stand up with President Xi and announce to the world jointly what their reductions of emissions would be. That did exactly what we intended it to. It sent the message to the world, whoa, China and the United States are working together. They're serious about making Paris happen. So we went to Paris. 196 nations, approximately, signed on to the agreement in Paris that we would all work according to our best ability with very specific plans laid out by each state, as to each country, as to what we would do. And that we were going to aim to hold the Earth's temperature to 2 degrees centigrade increase with a hope of targeting 1.5 degrees. And the reason for 2 degrees is that the vast majority of scientists in the world, in the IPCC, the international, uh, you know, the, the UN uh, framework agreement for, for climate, um, they, they uh, had all told us as scientists, not politicians, not ideologues, not exploiters, not demagogues, as scientists, they told us if you, that, that there's a tipping point where if the Earth's temperature rises to a certain level and you go over it, we can't tell you how cascading negatively the effect will be on food or water or rain or storms or so forth. But here's what we do know, and they laid out an agenda. They won the Nobel Peace Prize for this incredible effort they made, Al Gore and, and, and the IPCC. And we started to get even more serious trying to do this. So we arrived in Paris, and we knew when we left, and I said this to the whole plenary session after we, it was gaveled in, we got a Paris agreement, I won't go through all how we got it, we got it done. And um, I said to everybody there, I said, folks, this is brilliant, it's wonderful, we should be as excited as we are, and it was very emotional. But we are not guaranteeing the world we will hold the Earth's temperature to a rise of 2 degrees centigrade. We're just not achieving that in this, because no country is reducing enough to meet that target. But what we hoped was that we were sending a sufficient signal to governments, to the private sector, that every one of those 196 countries were going to do their level damnedest to be able to try to do everything they could. And by doing that, we were sending a message to the private sector, to the marketplace. Hey guys, here it is, the biggest market the world has ever seen, the energy market. Why energy? Because energy choices are the solution to climate change. And it is not something we have to wait 30 or 40 years for somebody to discover. Solar today is cheaper than coal. We're letting contracts out for solar at 2.9 cents, 3 cents a kilowatt hour. Last year in the United States of America, 75% of all the new electricity we created in our country came from solar. Do you know that? I bet you, you, I mean, people don't know what's happening. You know what coal was last year? 0.2%. So we succeeded in sending the message to the marketplace. For the first time in human history, in, in the funding of energy, more money was invested, $358 billion, in alternative renewable sustainable energy than in fossil fuels. So we're moving in the right direction. Here's the problem, folks. This is why I'm glad John brought it up and I want to talk to you. We are no one anywhere moving fast enough to hold it to 1.5, let alone 2. We're on track right now in this century to hit 4 degrees centigrade, which is 7 degrees Fahrenheit. Go read. Go back and Google when you have time right now. Go back and Google the impact of climate change at 7 degrees. Go read the article. There's an article in today's Washington Post about how the IPCC is meeting right now, trying carefully to figure out how they tell people how dangerous this is, where we are right now. I mean, we're at a, you know, a great teaching institution. 
and the place where respect for creation is taught in fundamental ways. But we're not respecting God's work, creation. You pick up the paper today and you'll see, well, I'll leave, you know, I just, this is about life and death. And I'm, I'm, you know, people sometimes accuse me of getting a little bit hot about this. And I do. I'm angry about it. Because the decision that the President of the United States made to get out of Paris for ideological reasons was not based on one single scientific fact, nor did he tell the truth to the American people about, about the burden that it placed on us. He said, we have to get out from it because it's too big a burden. No, no country accepted a burden that it didn't define for itself. Because the beauty of Paris was everybody took on the responsibilities that they thought they could take on. Think about it. So how can you tell America we got to get out of this because it places an unfair burden on us when there is no agreement whatsoever that places any burden other than what you've said you're willing to do. And what we're willing to do is de minimis. And people are going to die because the United States of America has given up its role of leadership to pull out of there and governors and mayors are left struggling to try to make it. Well, I'm proud to be able to tell you this. 38 states in our country, despite the president, have adopted and are living under renewable portfolio standard laws that require them to move to a rate of X amount of usage of, of, of alternative renewable energy over a X period of time. 38 states, and those 38 states represent 80% of the population of our nation. And the day after Donald Trump pulled out, governors stood up, Governor of New York, Massachusetts, California, Washington, Oregon, and all said, we're staying in. We're going to meet this target. And they're going to continue to try to. And at the same time, mayors, over, over a thousand mayors in our country, all the big city mayors, are all trying to stay in. So when I go around the world now and I talk to people about it, I said, let me tell you something, folks. Donald Trump may have pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but I got news for you. The American people are still in and they're gonna to try to stay in. The problem is, it's not enough. How do we get through to people? It's not enough. It's still going to four degrees, even if we're in Paris. So we've gotta stop countries from building coal-fired power plants. We've got to begin to shift faster to electricity for uh, electricity produced by clean sources for transportation. And, and build buildings that are you know, a lot of emissions come out of buildings that get built. We've got to reduce the emissions that come from buildings. All of this is within our power. And the last thing I leave you within on this is this. This is the largest marketplace the world has ever known. It is a phony choice to tell you, and people do tell you, oh, we can't afford to do this. We can't afford to, you know, have America's economy be focused on all this environment stuff because that's going to cost us jobs. No, it is jobs. There are about 55,000 coal workers in the United States of America today. You know how many people there are in sustainable development energy? 300,000. The fact is the fastest growing job in the United States of America is wind or turbine technician and solar deployer. The problem is we're not doing it fast enough to meet the goal, so you can't just sit there and say, oh, it's okay, we'll get there. We're not gonna get there the way we're going. We have to do more. Last year, we spent $265 billion on three storms, to clean up the three storms. Maria, Irma, and Harvey. Harvey dropped more water on the Houston area in five days than goes over Niagara Falls in a year. Irma had sustained winds, first hurricane ever to have sustained winds over 185 miles an hour for 24 hours. And Maria, we all know what Maria did to Puerto Rico. So I'm saying this to you, there's a bright side to this and here's the bright side and I write about it in the book. When I first came back from Vietnam, the first thing I did was not demonstrate against the war. First thing I did was become involved in Earth Day, 1970. And what we did was we brought, we brought 20, was it 20 million Americans out of their homes 
in cities all over America to make clear to politicians people didn't want to live next to toxic waste sites, they didn't want to breathe air that made them sick, they didn't want to drink water that gave them cancer, basic things. And we didn't stop there. We translated it into political action, into making the issue a voting issue. We targeted the 12 worst votes in the United States Congress, labeled those on the environment, labeled those 12 the dirty dozen. And in the next election, seven of the 12 lost their seats. I tell you folks, because I had five elections, I got elected to the Senate five times, there is nothing like your friends losing on a specific issue to stiffen the spine of the people who survive. And the survivors then passed the Clean Air Act, safe drinking water, marine mammal protection, coastal zone management. And Richard Nixon, the president then, had to sign the Environmental Protection Agency, which we didn't even have in America then. He signed it into law. And everything else got better after that. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio stopped lighting on fire, literally. I mean, I, I, folks, you, you can't describe this. but. Then people got lazy. They said, oh, we've done it all, we're going away. But then we began to become aware of what's happening with climate change. So uh, in 34 days, we have a course correction election in America. And we have to make sure that the candidates are being held accountable and what they're willing to do and what they're going to do for the environment, for climate change, for energy, and for a host of other issues, teacher pay, children, health care that's for everybody that doesn't have pre-existing condition decline, you know, the, the, the destroyers and so forth. So the, the message of this book is in, from start to finish, this book lays out the path for how you hold government accountable by telling you stories of how we did, how John McCain and I made something happen, how we held Noriega accountable for putting drugs in the veins of young Americans, how we, and, 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 you know, polluting a, a, a bank with, with money laundering, and you run the list of these things. People, if you're gonna be a country that's a democracy that lives by rule of law, citizens have to hold the system accountable so it is genuinely by rule of law. And it was young people in the 1960s in the civil rights movement, young people in the women's movement, young people in the environment movement, young people in the peace movement. All of these things happened because kids actually took time off from school. We had what was called the Peanut Butter and Jelly Brigade in New Hampshire that went up there to help Gene McCarthy send a message to Lyndon Johnson that you can't run for president again. And he got enough of a vote in New Hampshire that Lyndon Johnson, after the primary, said, I'm not running for president again. And that's when Robert Kennedy got in, and we had more primary. But think about it, folks. You all have an amazing power. I hope you will recognize your own power right now. I know you have to study like hell. I know you've got to figure out about graduate school. Uh, I understand that. But lots of folks before you have managed to make it through their exams and write their dissertation and still change their nation at the same time. And we need you more than ever. We cannot be a country where only 54.2% of the eligible voters in our nation see fit to come out and vote for the presidency of the United States. That 54.2, that's last time. That was 2016. When Barack Obama won the presidency in 2008, it was 62.3% that turned out. When I ran against George W. in 04, it was 60.3% that turned out. And you know the last time it was 54.2%? When Al Gore had a close election, which he legitimately won and they didn't count all the votes, and lost by the Supreme Court's decision, but that's the last time it was that close. We shouldn't have races that close given the stark choices we face in this nation. And it means you all have got to take your voting privilege seriously and, and uh, you've got to come out and make our democracy work again by holding it accountable, by making the issues that matter voting issues. I know that was a long answer, but nothing I say here, nothing I say here today 
is more important than trying to understand how we guide our own democracy and restore it. I mean that. Thank you. Sir, one last question for me, and then we'll... One last one for me as they set up the microphone here and uh, we open it up to students. Uh, one of the most gut-wrenching chapters in the book is called The Open Wound about Syria. Um, and you uh, write in, uh, very detailed about the, the back and forth with the Russians in particular about trying to get a meaningful ceasefire in, in Syria that could allow the space for diplomatic uh, uh, negotiation to proceed, a peaceful solution to the civil war. But you also wrote about wishing you had a better hand as you sat down with the Russians. What did the Obama administration do right, and what did we do wrong in terms of trying to end that war? And now that President Trump has bombed Syria twice, does he have leverage that maybe you didn't have? No, because he never... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got other ones. Um. Because he hasn't followed it up with any diplomacy whatsoever to bring the parties to the table. I started something with Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, called the International Syria Support Group. And we got, improbable as it sounds, we had the Saudi Arabians at the table, we had the Emiratis, we had the Kuwaitis, we had the Jordanians, we had the Egyptians, and we had the Turks, and the Russians, and the Iranians. And we got everybody to agree on a resolution that we took to the UN and passed 15 to nothing in the Security Council that the solution to Syria was a negotiated peace in Geneva along the lines of a communique that had already been negotiated, which said we're going to let the opposition have a legitimate role within the government. There'll be a temporary governance process. We work out the modalities and you have an election of a new pre of a president, Assad, whatever. And we ran into um, buzzsaw of people who had certain demands that Assad had to leave first or not leave first or whatever. During this time, we negotiated a number of ceasefires. And Assad would break the ceasefires. Or al-Nusra, which is really al-Qaeda, would break the ceasefire. ISIS wasn't there yet at this point in time, but they came along. And um, I kept arguing, folks, we can't just ask them. They have different interests. If Assad is going to be allowed to say, I'm signing up to the ceasefire, and then he flies his airplanes and drops barrel bombs on children in schools and gasses people, we have to make it mean something that we're holding him accountable. Risk whatever the I know the risks, but there are always risks. I thought the risk was greater in losing any in granting impunity indirectly for not holding him accountable. So I argued that we ought to be willing to take his planes out of the sky, do something to dent his airports so that, or, or let him lose a few assets, military assets, that, and make it clear. Make it clear, and at this point, the Russians weren't in there. So I thought we had relatively low risk, and I thought we could get away with it. And in fact, I supported Donald Trump's retaliation for those things. I said publicly, I support the fact that uh, we're going to hold him accountable. But I don't support, and I said this at the same time, I don't support just a one-off bombing, and then you go about your business as if nothing else matters and nobody's leveraging the process towards a solution. Diplomacy is hard work. You've got to work it. You've got to pull people to the table. You've got to hold them accountable. And it takes leadership to do it, folks. You can't do it. And usually, we're the ones who make the greatest difference if and when we offer that kind of leadership. So I lost that argument. I mean, I never succeeded in persuading people that that's what we ought to do. People were arguing, oh, we're going to get dragged into a wider war. We're going to get dragged into this. Or, and ultimately, when Russia was there, well, we can't kill any Russians. We've got problems here. Sure, it got more complicated. But I am convinced, and I write this in the book, there's a reason Putin came in, because there was a vacuum. And he knew we weren't about to do anything. So he came in, once he's there, uh, you know, it's a bad deal. So here's a simple bottom line for all of you. Syria still remains to be resolved, and there will be no resolution without the Russians, Iranians, Arabs, and the United States and others at the same table 
to work it out. Just not going to happen. And, and every day the international community dithers on this and wastes time not wanting to tackle it, not wanting to do with the difficulties. A lot of young people, a lot of women, a lot of children are going to die because that's what's happening there. And, uh, you know, I think it's a sad moment for the international community and the order that we set up, uh, you know, to try to deal with these things. And by the way, Putin and Xi today, and you could follow this very closely, and it's worth following. It's really an intriguing component of the world we're living in uh, at this moment in time. Uh, President Xi has spoken quite directly and publicly in his speeches at the World Economic Forum and in various other fora, his speech to the 19th Party Congress. He has talked about how the liberal order of the West is rotten, it is in decline, the United States of America is in decline, and the real model for how you ought to do things is their model. The sort of authoritarian, uh, might makes right, get things done, make your decisions, get it done. And there are people in the world now who are attracted to that. This is a danger. All of you students here of foreign policy uh, at, at the Foreign Service School or otherwise, you, you got to think about this hard. Because uh, we, you know, we have to prove that democracy works effectively. We can't do that if we have a Congress that won't pass a budget or, or can't organize itself effectively or can't deal quickly with important issues of infrastructure rebuilding in America and so forth. I rode on a train that goes 300 miles an hour from Beijing to Tianjin. Uh, a glass of water was put on my table by the attendant, and the water was as still as that water at 300 miles an hour. I don't know how many of you have had the privilege of reading, riding on the Amtrak Regional. <laughs> um, you know, we, 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 are, we are the United States. That train, actually, the Acela can go 155 miles an hour. I don't know if anybody's embarrassed that we're half the speed of the Chinese. Uh, but. It can't go that far. It only goes over 150 for 18 miles of the trip from here to New York. People should be angry about that, embarrassed at that. If you go fast under the tunnel at Baltimore, the tunnel may cave in. If you go fast over, the, over those rickety bridges of the Chesapeake, the train will wind up in the Chesapeake. I mean, we're the country that invented the internet, the country that went to the moon. We need to rebuild America. And we need to deal with these relentless traffic jams where you can't move anywhere in our country. We're wasting productivity. We're wasting gas. It's, it's, I don't know about you, but I kind of I obviously haven't pulled all my hair out. But uh, this is really infuriating. And I think most Americans are angry today for a number of reasons. One, they know this is not who we are, and they're angry about it. They also know they're not getting the benefits of globalization. They know that the world changing so fast that, that government isn't keeping up, and, and uh, they feel shafted by the whole thing. And they know Washington is the swamp that Trump talked about, but this is just contributing more to it, what's going on now. So we need real change. And that change is best going to come by making sure some of these great candidates we have around the country, Republican and Democrat alike, I'm not being partisan, there are veterans of Iraq and veterans of Afghanistan and tremendous people who have decided to run to try to reclaim this thing. And, and um, we need to have a vision for the nation that takes us to uh, a much better place. Thank you, sir. All right, sir, I think we're uh, ready for questions. Um, please queue up at the microphone, uh, identify who you are and uh, what, uh, what year you are here in the program. We can go, we can go a little later. I'm not in a hurry. We can Okay, yes, yes ma'am. Hello. Okay, here's the deal, guys. I'm gonna try and take uh, a few questions simultaneously and I'm gonna try and give you rat-a-tat answers so we can get as many in as we can. So, just give me the first three. Hello, um, my name is Malak. I graduate SFS 22 and I'm also a Palestinian. My question is, um, the new administration has a new approach towards um, peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It has moved the uh, U.S. Embassy to the eternal capital of Israel, Jerusalem, and um, it has kicked the Palestinian mission from the Washington, D.C. It has also 
stop the funding for UNRWA. Um, what, do you, what is your opinion on this new approach, and what would you advise the Palestinian president to do? Okay, who's next? Hi, I'm Joseph Giorgioliani from a little country of Georgia in, in Europe. Um, What's your last name, Giovanni? Giorgioliani. Giuliani. Uh, my question pertains to Russia's destabilizing at attempts uh, in, um, in its neighborhood. Um, how do you think Trump's administration is tackling that issue in Ukraine and in Georgia and in the neighborhood of Russia? And what do you think that strategy will achieve? What do I think? Uh, this yeah. Trump strategy. strategy. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Andrew Hanna. I'm a first year student in the MSFS. Uh, Congress is starting to assert some oversight on the war in Yemen, asking the administration to verify whether steps are being taken to prevent civilian casualties by the coalition. However, the administration is deciding to stay the course, continue refueling Saudi and Emirati airplanes. Um, would you decide to stay the course if you were in that position yourself, knowing what you know now? Do you want to stop at three? Or? Yeah, let me take three quickly if I can um, and try to do justice to them, but also get more people in here. Um, on the Palestinian uh, situation, um, obviously, administrations have tried for years to solve that problem. The Oslo Accords embraced in 1993 the concept that we were going to have two states, a state, a viable state for the Palestinians and a Jewish state a state for Israel, uh, though the, the, the Oslo didn't say Jewish state. Oslo said that Israel would be safe and secure and define the lines. The West Bank would go back to the Palestinians. And they had a specific timetable. The timetable was never met for various reasons. I'm not casting blame, but it was never met. Um, and we are now in a, in a very bad place there because and, and for anybody here who, 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 who is uh, Israeli or Jewish, I, I want to make it clear. I, I, 28 years in the Senate, I had a 100% voting record for Israel. But I also always tried to learn about the Palestinian situation. I went to Gaza. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, and, and I knew there was going to have to be some kind of a compromise here that respected Israel's desire to be a Jewish state and to be able to defend itself by itself. Um, and Oslo contemplated that. What's happened is there's been a refusal, frankly, by a lot of folks, the international community and Israel, to build the kind of capacity within the Palestinian state that began to give people confidence that it was something that you could do without creating dangers. And the Palestinians have had their own struggles because of Hamas in Gaza, and, and Abbas and the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, uh, you've never had a unity of Palestinians. You've never had an organized capacity to get them to be where they need to be to sort of say, OK, this idea of a state makes sense. Um, here's the danger of where we are now. The majority of the current government of Israel has publicly, the majority of the cabinet has publicly said on record there will never be a Palestinian state. And the Palestinians are in enough disorder that they're not in a place where they can sort of really push back with any credibility. And the problem with that is that the population today between the Jordan River Valley and the Mediterranean, that is West Bank and, and Israel, is already majority non-Jewish. Not all Palestinian, but non-Jewish. And so what happens in the future? This is the question I tried to raise as Secretary of State. It's a question which Ehud Barak, the former prime minister and general, raises and others raise. How can Israel be a unitary state with a majority population that is not Jewish and be still a Jewish state and a democracy? There is no way to reconcile that, my friends. You, you can't give full voting rights to all those people in the same way and therefore be a full democracy and remain Jewish. And I don't know anybody in Israel who believes that there's going to be a Palestinian prime minister of Israel. So obviously, this has to be resolved somehow. 
And there's an issue, there's a, there's a thing in diplomacy called ripeness. Uh, you can lead a horse to water. In my case, you could lead two horses to water in the desert, but neither would drink. That's where we are. Not ripe. Just not, and, and we can't thrust it on them. It's not something that is either appropriate or doable. So we have to let a little time go by, let people sort of sink into these questions, and hopefully there is a ripeness that will come with time. And I pray for that. Because what the region could be with peace is staggering. I mean, the three Abrahamic religions all have major sites in Jordan, West Bank, Jerusalem, Israel. It's stunning. And in other parts, Medina, Mecca. I mean, you think about it. Islam and, and, and Judaism and Christianity. And if you could get peace, my God, that region. It's the least integrated region in the world today. Which is why I push so hard and I will continue to try to push for what I think is common sense and the only way to really have peace. On the issue, Mr. Giuliani, of um, Russia and Ukraine, uh, I'm, I'm not clear because there really hasn't been a lot of public diplomacy on this issue. It's like Syria. I'm not clear on exactly where the administration is. As you know, Mr. Uh, the President went to Helsinki to meet with President Putin. Uh, it might have been an ideal place to come out and announce you have some kind of an agreement on the further implementation of the Minsk agreement, or you have arrived at some kind of an agreement on how you're now going to revitalize that process and actually create an election in the Donbass and have peace in Ukraine, but nothing, not a word, no, no communicate, nothing that suggested there's, there's a diplomatic, diplomatic path in, 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 in uh, sight. So I, I think that just remains a great big question mark. You ask me what do I think of their strategy? It's a great big question mark. With respect to uh, Yemen, Yemen is one of the other sores, <laughs> open wounds, if you will. Um, I put a peace proposal on the table. I went to Oman. I got help from the Omanis. I met with, I met with the Houthi. I met with uh, the Houthi and uh, managed to get Al Houthi to sign an agreement that he would go back to Kuwait and that they were ready to negotiate on the, on the same terms that had been previously negotiated in Kuwait, where there would be an interim period. And then Hadi would resign as the president of Yemen, and there would be a new government, and we had the shape of the government. It was all there. That peace proposal is still on the table. And people in the region tell me it's still operative, but nobody's working it. And the reason is, I think that uh, fundamentally, there's an effort to try to have a military victory there. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, that's doable if you look at the experience of Egypt under you know, Gamal Abdel Nasser, where they, uh, the Egyptians lost about 45,000 troops there and still didn't win, uh, not unlike Afghanistan in many ways. So who knows? Uh, but let me be clear about this. Yes, the Iranians are meddling. Yes, the Iranians are sending weapons in there. And I won't get into all the rationales, et cetera, but I'll just say to you, Iran has to also be part of that solution. And it is appropriate to hold them accountable for missiles, for Hezbollah, for threats to Israel. Nobody is suggesting that Iran is somehow immune to accountability. But, uh, you know, again, this takes a kind of comprehensive diplomacy of people talking to each other. And it may be happening, but the world and those of us who follow foreign policy are simply not aware that it is, in fact, happening. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Grace Rector, and I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. Um, and I was hoping you could talk about the international and domestic implications of the US military industrial complex. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we spend a large sum, almost $600 billion on military. However, it's commonly known that our education system is lacking here in the US. 
Um, so in regards to the international implications, I'd love to know your thoughts on the fact that we're giving, that 80% of the arms that we're selling internationally are going to non-democratic states and what you think we should do to either continue that pattern or to prevent it. And then domestically, if we should be decreasing our budget on military in order to give to more um, social sectors. Thank okay, you. Okay, next please. Go ahead. Thank you very much for coming here tonight, sir. My question had to do specifically with the illiberal uh, authoritarian and populist states that have been creeping up around the world over the past 10 years. Some of these countries are too important to be alienated, pushed away. Turkey, for example, has a vital geostrategic role in the Middle East, and yet its politics are alarming, to say the least. I wanted to ask you, how should the United States both confront such practices while keeping such countries as friends? Good questions. One more. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Nadika. I'm an MSFS student in Professor Kirby's class. Um, and my question is about the fact that a lot of right-wing parties in the West are increasingly playing on people's fears of refugees and immigrants to get votes. Um, and this is creating very hostile policies in Europe and in the United States. Um, responding to that with facts, like refugees being the most vetted population that enters the U.S. don't seem to change minds. So, in your opinion, what is an effective way to change minds? Okay, quickly. Um, the mill industrial complex is something, obviously, that President Dwight David Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address in the 1950s. Um, and it was a hell of a lot smaller then than it is today, obviously. Um, tragically, we're living in a world today which does require a uh, quite considerable level of expenditure, uh, but the right kind of expenditure. I think we're still putting a, a fair amount of funds in, into um, antiquated strategy, if you will. And we're not putting enough into the effort to try to deal with the, the real threat, the threat of cyber, for instance. Um, we need a much more concentrated effort on cyber. Personally, I mean, I, I came of age during the time when nuclear weapons were the great debate and arms control was the great effort. And when I came to the Senate, one of the biggest things I wanted to do was earn my way into the arms control observer group which had Sam Nunn and John Warner and Ted Kennedy, a bunch of people who were very senior. I finally got into it, but then it began to diminish, obviously, because we had the START Treaty, and we had gone from 50,000 warheads pointed at each other down to about 1,500 warheads, and now, under President Obama, we suggested we could even go lower. And many of you may have read that Henry Kissinger and Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, and George Shultz, former Secretary of State, and others have all argued that we should be aiming towards a world without nuclear weapons. So how do you get there? Well, you have to change the way we resolve conflict. I mean, that's one of the most critical things. But in terms of the military industrial complex, I mean, we need X number of aircraft carriers because they're very important to low level conflict. They're very important to show force. They're very important to help us mobilize flights where we may need them to deal with the ISIS, for instance. We have to stop ISIS from killing Yazidis in, uh, in Mount Sinjar, and, and we had to get airplanes to fly quickly from the Gulf to come in and bomb the mountain to stop them from doing it. So there are reasons to have a big aircraft carrier, but we don't need so many of them at that price for major war fighting in the context of the old kind of confrontation we envisioned, because most people understand that those are gonna be the first things to disappear in today's world. The missiles people have now, the accuracy of those missiles now. That's why I don't like what's happening in the South China Sea in terms of the, the, the militarization of those islands, but it's not because I see the militarization as a threat militarily. I see it as a threat in terms of sovereignty and an effort to try to lay claim to things that don't matter and therefore to maybe create a conflict. But the actual island is gonna disappear as fast as the aircraft carrier. It just doesn't make that much difference in today's warfare, which is why, for the first time in history, 
Fewer people are dying than any time than anybody could think of today. Notwithstanding that we hate what Boko Haram does, we hate what Al-Qaeda does, we hate what ISIS did, we, we, <clears throat> we, we are guarding against an airplane being hijacked or you know, a bomb in a subway. <clears throat> but fundamentally, there's been a profound shift because of the work that we have done where we have changed the nature of risk. So there's a larger sense of deterrence. You don't, with the exception of Putin taking Crimea and going into Ukraine, and the Myanmar army committing genocide against the Rohingya, you don't see a lot of state-on-state -state violence. You mostly see asymmetrical, non-state actors who are creating the violence, ISIS. Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, all these entities. And the dealing with them is not the military-industrial complex. We need some military. I mean, you look at what we're doing in Afghanistan, which now is excessive, and we have to transition and tailor into an actual anti-terrorism platform, not a you know, year-in, year-out uh, military you know, engagement. But I think Truly, the, the, so we need to start <coughs> rethinking long-term strategy in the military so we are defending ourselves adequately, but putting resources into things that are going to make a greater difference. And one of them, by the way, former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates used to argue this, and um, it, it is the, the criticality of the State Department and the USAID and the Peace Corps and others being a critical component of the spear because you've got to be able to bring people along with you and you've got to be able to do things that change the attitudes of people. If you don't change the attitudes of people, you're just going to have another generation of people bombing people and fighting people. And there are 1.8 billion young people in the world 15 years old or younger and about 300 million of them are not going to go to school anywhere. If we don't recognize that as a problem for us, as well as the places where they live, we're crazy. Because that's where the extremists are going to come from. That's where the bombs are going to come from. That's where the asymmetrical initiatives will come from. So I do want to see us get a better balance in how we spend our money between defense and long-term investment in diplomacy. Turkey, um, you said, use the word confront. I think, I think in diplo I mean, I don't shy away from confronting somebody when you have to confront them. But confrontation doesn't always get you what you want or get you what you want as fast as you might get it in a sort of reasoned, thoughtful, strategic way that begins to address the concerns and needs of the party that you're dealing with. And if you rush to just tell people what to do, uh, you can wind up uh, with a lot less people at the table willing to do what you want them to. That is what I found. When you, when you abruptly pull out of the Iran nuclear agreement, you empower the very hardliners who didn't want that agreement in the first place and who told, who told the president of the country that he didn't want them to negotiate but who let them negotiate, telling them, you can't trust America. They're going to bite you. And guess what? We pulled out of the agreement. So the hardliners who didn't want the agreement and told them you can't trust them now are saying, see, we told you so. And it'll be a long time before a leader can just come walking in and say, oh, yeah, I'm giving up, capitulate, and expect to go back to his country and still be the leader. So this is a problem. And uh, I think Turkey is the same kind of thing. I've met with uh, Erdogan many times. We've had important conversations on things. We've been able to work things out and get things done. I don't like what's happened in the country in lots of ways, obviously. But the United States, I'll tell you folks, I don't shy away from fighting for the values that we live by and espouse. But it's much harder for us to go around confronting people on that right now when our own system is as fouled up as it is. 
And I can remember sitting with a prime minister or a finance minister, and I'd say, hey, man, how are you doing on your budget? You guys going to be able to get your budget together? And I'd watch him sort of stiffen up and look at me. He was polite enough not to say, when's the last time you guys passed a budget? <laughs> uh, but think about it for a minute, seriously. Or I, I had to go to Egypt at one point in time, right after the revolution, when Morsi got kicked out and uh, al-Sisi came in. And the Emiratis had written a check for about $13 billion, and the Saudis had written a check for about $16 billion. And they were carrying Egypt, and we were talking to both, Saudis and Emiratis, who said, you know, we've got to help Egypt survive. And we said, of course we do. We have to help Egypt survive. The last thing we want is, the, is Egypt to crater. So I went to Egypt, and the most, you know what I had in my back pocket to help Egypt at this moment of crisis? $400 million. It was embarrassing. I actually did not tell the president about it while I was in the room with him there, because he would have, it, it, it just wouldn't have, it would have turned it off rather than helped you. So we've got to think about how we're going to go and remain relevant in the world in terms of influencing people and bring them along if, number one, we don't manage our own affairs more effectively, and if, number two, we don't have a stake in their lives in the way that we used to. China is spending a trillion dollars a year on the One Belt, One Road initiative. Now, it's not all fun and games because there are countries that are chafing a bit under the way they're doing it. But they're building $500 billion worth of laboratories and research centers in all of the countries that touch on the One Belt, One Road, about 68, 70 countries. They're building ports in Sri Lanka, in Djibouti. They're trying to get one in Myanmar, other places. And we're not, you know, we're not doing any of those things. We're treating, according to the speech the president gave at the UN the other day, we're into unilateralism and a new theory, the doctrine of patriotism. Now, I don't know what that is, um, uh, but if it's more of standing up in front of people and saying, you know, we're just going to take care of ourselves, us first, and so forth, it's a problem. Now, every president has always put America first. You cannot be elected president. You can't be a president if you don't put your country first. But when you jam it at people in a very public way, while you're talking about unilateralism, bashing NATO, insulting leaders of other countries who are your allies, folks, you're not going to win support at the UN General Assembly or anywhere else where you need to get things done on a multilateral basis. The way we stopped Ebola was multilateral. The way we dealt with AIDS in Africa, multilateral. You've got to have partners in the world. And when 95% of the goods of the world and the, and the consumers, 95% of the consumers of the world live in other countries, you need to have a way to be able to trade and have access to them. Finally, um, the uh, how to change minds um, in, with respect to, oh, immigration. This is the person in your class. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I didn't put her up to it. I believe, I know, I know you didn't. Just jokey. Um, folks, the way you deal with immigration is to be honest about it. Um, I understand why people are so angry. Because for years, Republican and Democrat administrations alike have kind of not done what's necessary to give people in our country who have a legitimate beef about l rule of law to give them a sense that you're serious about making the rule of law mean something. How do you get to 12 million people who are undocumented or here in the country? It's because you never did do something about it. Borders mean something. Borders define countries. Visas mean something. You know, green cards and passports mean something. And if they're gonna mean something and you're gonna have a whole bunch of people who get in line and work to do something, but a whole bunch of other people are going outside of it, you, 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 you are undermining your own definition of rule of law and your own sense of system. 
Now, we've tried to deal with that. The way we've tried to deal with that is with dreamers, is with a pathway to citizenship. And the compromise, on occasion, it seems to me, has been almost struck. Lindsey Graham worked on this, John McCain worked on this, people have tried to get there. And that is to agree that you are gonna beef up the border, that you are gonna try to make meaningful the line and the responsibility to accept certain things, which is why people went through the various things you have to do to earn citizenship, like speak English, know the history, be, stay out of trouble, pay your taxes, have a job. I mean, the long litany of things that then earn you your way in to undo this notion of what happened with the 12 million. But you can't expect people to buy into that solution if at the same time you're letting another 12 million in. They're not gonna accept it. It's very simple, it's common sense. So I believe that we gotta to talk to each other. What we do have to do also is stop allowing any of these demagogues to exploit this thing. Because there are people who are trying to appeal every day to the worst instincts of people, and, and those are the people who stand up and say, the Democrats want no borders. The Democrats want to allow unlimited immigration, blah, 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 when everybody knows that's not true. But it's a powerful political weapon. And if we don't stand up and say no to demagogues and not allow them to appeal to the lowest common denominator of American politics, we're gonna screw our own system even more than we're already in trouble today. So the balance is, you gotta have courageous people who come together and say we're tired of the exploitation, we're not gonna allow the demagoguery, we're gonna fix the system by putting in place the, 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 the mechanisms that will guard the border, that will deal with the issue, give sovereignty its respect, but at the same time, not penalize families that have been here for 20 and 25 years who deserve to have the pathway to citizenship. Now, I don't know how else to do it. That's you know, sort of the most honest, fair way that I can think of to try to approach it that deals with everybody's concerns. And that's what legislating and, and proper policy making is all about. And, and that's what we have to do. So I think, I hope that answers your question. How much time do we have? Could we do another round? Sir, I think we've got time. We're, one more round? For one, for okay, one. let's give it a few. We'll see what the questions are and we'll go there. I tried. Go ahead. Um, I must say, I'm really impressed. It's Thursday night and nobody's breaking out yet for, you know. Uh, thank you so much, Secretary Kerry. Uh, my name is Lu, Shun, uh, Lu Shuni. I'm come from, uh, my name is Lu Shuni, and I come from China. So having been living in China for 22 years and only have been here for two years, I do respect the U.S. democracy system, and I especially appreciate how you engage and through multilateral ways to engage the world to pursue your values. But every day I am here, I also feel, uh, hear a lot of fears. It's the fears about um, the competition from different kind of values and different ways of running the government, and the fears about bipartisan divide, and fears of potential uh, depression, economic depression in the future, and even the fear of the, uh, your citizens telling the truth. So my question will be, uh, today we don't, probably don't have the president in the White House telling us the only thing we need to fear is fear itself. So where do you think that strong voices were coming from to the U.S. people? They're telling them how to conquer the fear and going to engage and going to like lead the system you believe in? That's my question, thank you. Good question, thank you. Next. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. My name is Esther. I'm a second year at MSFS and also in Professor Kirby's class. Um, I think you've touched on this all evening, but uh, I wanted to ask you specifically on the conduct of diplomacy. We're facing increasingly new challenges in the future and um, we can't be doing what we've done. And I was hoping you could speak to, with the benefit of having some distance um, from running the State Department, what you would recommend um, that we change about our conduct of diplomacy to become agile and resilient in the face of um, the challenges we're facing. Good question, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Miriam Frost. I'm a, an MSFS student as well. Um, in 2017, you were an international observer at, for the uh, presidential election in Kenya. Uh, you backed the results of the first uh, round of that election, which was uh, ultimately annulled uh, and rerun due to widespread abnormalities. 
Uh, so I was wondering, looking back on that time, would you have uh, done anything different? Okay, next, is that three, was it? That's three. Can I make it quick? Say again? It'll be a quick question, I promise. It'll be quick? Uh, this one does have to be the last one, I'm afraid. Go ahead. You know, everybody behind okay. you is about to say it's gonna be quick. <laughs> It'll be very quick, don't worry. Uh, Fine, well. <laughs> Two years ago, uh, my friend Jalen Smith and I took a picture with you at Baked and Wired, so I was wondering what your favorite cupcake flavor is. <laughs> Thanks. It's a great one to end it on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you, but I, I buy cookies. Um, I, am, I am the original cookie monster. Um, China and fear. Uh, you're, look, there are people who are scared. Uh, the key, there are two keys, I think. One is the United States of America needs to uh, be ready and willing to uh, work with China on things that also address China's fears. China thinks that we're trying to contain it. Uh, and they believe that we don't necessarily listen to some of their concerns uh, in the region they're very uncomfortable with uh, our ballistic missile defense, with our deployments regarding uh, North Korea and Japan and Korea, et cetera. Um, so we need to continue discussions that we did hold and which were very important discussions. And I think we had a very good management relation of differences. President Xi and President Obama and, and I and the sort of, you know, National Security Team met with President Xi a number of times with the President, and, uh, and they met one-on-one -on, -one on occasion. And we really worked through these things very effectively, I thought. Uh, we agreed that there were things we could work on very overtly that we agreed on, and there were some differences. South China Sea sovereignty was a difference. Um, how to approach North Korea was a difference. Uh, Taiwan, obviously, uh, and the three communiques and so forth. And, and, but those were sort of agreed upon, compartmentalized uh, differences, and, and they didn't get in the way of our being able to work on other things together. So China was actually very cooperative in helping to negotiate the nuclear agreement. And China did ratchet up its sanctions against uh, North Korea twice under our treaty, never getting them to the level we wanted, but we set the table for President Trump to come in and raise them twice more. And, and finally get Kim Jong-un's attention. Uh, though we never expected a love affair before anything's ever happened. Um, so, um, so that's one thing you have to do, is, is make sure that people understand that we're not uh, engaged in, in, a, in a containment standoff, uh, et cetera. And I think that um, the other thing we could do is actually work proactively, cooperatively with China which I did negotiate with them and what they, they agreed to do, which was work together in going to some of these countries for development on something like the One Belt, One Road or AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Bank, where we could together go into a nation and say to the president of that country and his cabinet or to a, to a you know, to a, uh, uh, you know, to a more, centralized leadership, if that's what they had as a government, and say to them, we're here together to tell you that we're prepared to help you with your infrastructure development, help you with your um, marketplace, but, and we're prepared to put X billions of dollars jointly into helping you build out your health system, or helping you to build out your port, create an airport, create a rail system, roads, whatever it is that's gonna help you modernize and begin to be able to attract capital and therefore more investment for the private sector. But you have to be able, you have to deal, you have to be different. You have to have accountability in your transactions. You have to have transparency on contracts. You have to have a one-stop shop where we can come in 
and uh, people can actually get decisions made, and they're not going to be held up to blackmail from any member of your cabinets, et cetera. In other words, de-corruptizing, de-risking for the capital. And if we were to do that, folks, think of the exponential rapidity with which we could move countries to a better investment posture, to a, a way and a place where private capital itself might decide, hey, this is a marketplace that we're willing to enter because it is de-risked and there are rules of engagement and we will be able to make some money. So we could be developing so much faster in places in the world. And, and therefore, I think there's a way to proactively work with China that would break down this fear on both sides. But China has got to open up its markets and be fair and deal in the same way with the United States and Europe and other trading partners. You cannot hold up a technology company to say, well, you can do business here, but you're going to have to share your technology with our partner company you have to work with. We don't do that. That's not a free market system. It's not a fair system. And, and if they're going to do that and effectively steal technology from companies, they're going to continue to create um, the, the unevenness that we have in the marketplace now. So I think there are clear things we can do. I hope the administration will do them and not create an all-out trade war, which is going to cost Americans all the, all the increase in their wages that they may or may not get or that may come with uh, uh, increased growth is going to be chewed up by increased cost of all the goods that have tariffs on them because it's going to get passed on to consumers. And it may ultimately cost us jobs because of the production structure for aluminum or steel or whatever it is. With respect to uh, um, Uh, what, re what changes would I recommend to sort of meet the new challenges that we face in the context of diplomacy? How can it move fast enough? How do we deal with this modern world we're in? It's very, it, you know, it's very difficult. Diplomacy can't always move fast enough because it depends on what the relationship is between a country and its people and us and so forth. Uh, some diplomacy is painstaking. Um, but I do think we have to move faster. We cannot be old-fashioned in the way that we approach the world today. What's happening in the world today is goods are moving faster, services are moving faster, ideas are moving faster, people are moving faster, and many more of them are moving with extraordinary travel opportunity opened up because there's 450 million people who've come out of poverty in China, 400 million out of poverty in uh, India. Uh, and, and, you know, 15 years ago, Korea was a recipient of aid. Today, Korea is a donor of aid to other countries. So the world is moving at a pace. I sometimes say to people that I think there's industrial revolution-sized changes taking place in terms of distribution of power and hierarchy and how the world manages, because look at all the platforms of information. And it's all moving at digital pace, unlike the glacial, the pace of, which was fast for then, but glacial compared to today of the Industrial Revolution. But the same size changes are taking place, folks. I mean, those millions of young kids I just referred to, most of them after a certain age all have smartphones. They may not have a job. And they may be in the employ of extremists and recruiting other extremists, but they got smartphones. And they know what other people in the world have, which always accents what you don't have. So uh, this is a challenge for diplomacy to move faster. And I think that uh, it, it really is the challenge of government today. The one thing in the world that is moving faster, that is not moving with it faster, is government. And diplomacy is part of that. So we've got to be much more agile, much quicker to get money to be able to deal with a crisis, move people to deal with the crisis. There has to be much greater synergy between the Defense Department and the State Department. I'm happy to say that that's been worked on now for a couple of administrations. It's getting better. Uh, I don't know how it is right now uh, because of 
some of the problems the State Department had in the first two years. We'll see what happens. On uh, Kenya in 2017, the election. So uh, let, me, let me explain this to everybody. I, I've been privileged to be an observer in a number of different places. I observed elections when I was a brand new senator in the Philippines because I went to visit with Ferdinand Marcos, a dictator. I was a, really, I was you know, 41 years old, 42 years old. I'd just come to the Senate, a uh, freshman. And I wanted to go to the Philippines because some family, some cousins of mine, people had been involved in um, early diplomacy, had been very involved in the Philippines, and I was fascinated by it. So I went to meet with Marcos as a young senator. I spent five hours with Ferdinand Marcos, and it was mesmerizing. It was fascinating. And I came out of the meeting absolutely convinced that this guy was robbing his country blind, had an incredible cockamamie theory of why he should be deified and be the leader of this uh, democracy, uh, and was imprisoning people, torturing and so forth, and I thought he ought to go. Uh, I went back to the United States Senate. I passed a resolution saying uh, that we were now going to link our aid to human rights and to free elections in the Philippines. So Marcos kind of got mad at me and said, well, I'm going to show this young whippersnapper who's in charge. And he called a snap election, what's called a snap election, a quick election, thinking he'll win easily and then the whole thing go away and Kerry will go away and whatever. So I started to work with a group in the Philippines called NAMFREL, National Movement for Free Election in the Philippines. And I went over several times, worked with Cory Aquino, with Joe um, uh, Cimentione, who was the uh, leader of this, uh, Concepcion, Jose Concepcion, who was the leader of the uh, NAMFREL and other things. And we put in place a monitoring system, election accountability. And on election day, because I was, I was the only Democrat appointed, I was one, the only Democrat from the Senate appointed to be on this election observer group. And I went over with Dick Luger, who was chair of the committee then, and we watched the elections. And one night, uh, I was at the hotel where General MacArthur holed up during the war. There's, there was a MacArthur suite there. And I was having dinner, and these women came up to me crying and said, Senator, you've got to come to the cathedral. You must come. This election is being stolen. So I went down to the cathedral. I met in the sacristy with these 13 women who were crying. And they had had the courage to come out of the polling place nearby and sought refuge in the cathedral and said to me, he's stealing the election. We're getting the raw numbers coming into us from around the country, and we put them into the computer, but they don't come out. They come out in favor of Marcos. It's not. So I said, well, we've got to tell this story to the world, because this is the smoking gun. And I write about this in, in the book. And so we held a press conference in front of the altar in this cathedral where most of the lights weren't on. The lights came from the media that came, the bright lights like these shining. And, and it was, looked like they all had a halo around them. It was quite remarkable. And they stood up one by one and told the story of the election being stolen. That was it, folks. There was only one Democrat from the Senate on that trip, but the entire report, which has already been written, saying it was a good election, was rewritten. We went back. Ronald Reagan sent Senator Lacks all over to tell Marcos, it's over, you got to quit. We pulled our support, and he left. That was it, the end of a dictator. I say this to you because I've had some practice looking at elections. I monitored the elections in the Sudan. I monitored the elections in Palestine once with President Carter. And so I went to Kenya. I knew President Kenyatta. Uh, like him, we get along well. Um, the, they'd had a terrible election the four years previous to that. And they'd had violence after the election. But in preparation for this election, I saw a meticulous effort to make the election count. And it was a very ornate system of paper ballot counting. And I went to several of the countings. And I sat there while 
unbelievably complicated, you know, not complicated, but detailed instructions were being followed by the person who ran the place. And, and she would read off, okay, now everybody here, this is the next step. Do you all agree? Yes. So-and-so's campaign, do you agree? Kenyatta campaign, do you agree? And um, uh, I watched every ballot be counted. The ballots had pictures, so you knew who you were voting for. Very simple ballot, picture of the person, big X. And, and, and each ballot was held up for each observer of each campaign to see. And we watched while each ballot was counted, put back into a you know, big Tupperware kind of box with locks on it, with, with straps that were sealed. Everybody watched the seal. Does everybody agree this is sealed? Does everybody agree there are five? Yes, this is the one. So I watched this in, in two or three places. And it was clear to me that where there were observers and where everybody had been let in and where everybody was represented, that these ballots were counted properly and the ballots were all preserved. So all you had to do, and the ballots had guards, and, and everybody knew they were preserved. Nobody contested that. There was never a suggestion you couldn't do a recount. And so the losing candidate um, complained about some kind of computer irregularity. And we <laughs> knew from the way it was counted that there was a check on whether there was any irregularity. The numbers that were hand counted were put on a sheet of paper that was hand delivered with copies of that sheet of paper handed to each of the campaigns. So if anybody tried to change the copy, the campaign would know it. Nobody ever alleged that. Nothing was ever alleged to that effect. There was supposedly some nefarious computer malfunction, but when you looked at it, the counts came in accurately according to what was there. Now, there were a few places where they didn't have um, everybody there, very few, and there were a few places where the electronic system of sending didn't work effectively. But in those places, we still had the vote count that took place, and there was no, and you could check the, the, the numbers that were sent in against the number that still remained on the box and in the hands of all the campaigns. So I and others from Europe saw that this was a ploy, to, saw that the, we, we believe the complaining was a ploy to try to throw the election out and, and simply put, a, put the country through another round of the same thing, which served no fundamental purpose because they'd really done it almost, not quite perfectly, but sufficiently that none of the discrepancies would have made a difference in the outcome of the election. I was totally surprised when the court made the decision that it made. I think it, I don't agree with the decision. I thought they could have gone otherwise, uh, but they didn't. But it's their country. It's their court. It's their system. So we supported the idea of having another election. And indeed, it came out the same way that this one, or I can't remember exactly how it played out. But so to me, uh, you know, they complained and they try to blame the observers who called it the way it was because that's the way it was. So the answer to your question is no. I would not uh, change what I did uh, unless I had a redux in which I had the capacity to make sure that they had a double check on the electronic piece, uh, but it didn't change anything in the outcomes. So that happens sometimes, folks. Can I leave all of you, please, with a, I've, I've put some heavy pieces on you purposefully. I'm optimistic about our ability to change this thing. I really am. And that, I'm not saying that for your sake. Uh, we've been through really tough times in this country before. You go back and read about the, I mean, God, think of what happened when the assassinations took place here in the city. April 15th and, 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 and uh, you know, with Abraham Lincoln and Seward and people being attacked in their homes and people didn't know what the conspiracies were. We made it through. We made it through the Civil War. We made it through the Red Scare in the early 1900s. We made it through, you know, um, 
the uh, World War II and beyond. We made it through Richard Nixon as recently as 1970, 71, 72, and 3, 4, when he lied to the country, was proven to be a crook, had an enemies list, politicized the FBI, fired the special prosecutor. We made it through Martin Luther King being assassinated, Megar Evers assassinated, Robert Kennedy assassinated, pipe bombs in our streets with people being killed in buildings because of revolutionaries, people with machine guns kidnapping people from their homes, uh, you know, the streets of various cities, Detroit, elsewhere, on fire, houses burning, riots taking place. Uh, we made it through a period when colleges couldn't have exams and the campuses became completely enraged because of Kent State, what happened when students were shot demonstrating. So I, 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 we went through all that. I have total confidence in the institutions of our country and the ability of our country if we're presented with the right choices to make the right choices. And I told you about Earth Day. I mean, if we can do that and have that kind of accountability, if we can make the issues that matter to you, voting issues. When I was an undergraduate, I had a history professor who said to me, not to me, the whole class, big lecture class, and he said, all politics is a reaction to felt needs. I didn't know what it meant particularly back then. I know what it means now, and a lot of you do too, I'm sure. Felt needs. If you feel it, it's a political need, and you better find a way to respond to it. May not be totally legit, may not be totally real, but if you feel that need, it's like the immigration thing I just talked about. It's a felt need. You've got to respond to them. And if you make those felt needs voting issues, then you begin to build the mandate that allows you to reclaim our future and reclaim our democracy. When Benjamin Franklin, I'm going to Philadelphia tomorrow to, to talk to the World Affairs Council, and, and you know, there's a wonderful quote of Ben Franklin who walked down the steps of Constitution Hall after they had worked late into the night again and again and again, but finally finished the Constitution of our country for the second round after they did the principal constitution by which we live today. And as he walked down the steps, this woman yelled to him and said, Dr. Franklin, what do we have? A monarchy or a republic? And he looked out at her and he said, a republic if you can keep it. If you can keep it. We're being tested. There is nothing that's automatic pilot about who we are. We are still referred to as an experiment. Think about that. 230 plus years, whatever, since then. We are an experiment. And what we become and where we go now depends on our reclaiming real values, not allowing people to talk about alternative facts. There are no alternative facts. And we have to begin to reassert a primacy for common sense and, and for the essence of democracy, which is truth. Truth. And there's, there's only one way to do that in a democracy. You know, Winston Churchill famously said, democracy is the worst form of government in the world except for everything else. Think about it. We, honestly, we, those of you lucky enough to be history majors, um, but other majors too will get a chance to read the history. Think about it, you know, go back to the Roman Empire, to the killings of the, you know, first 10 centuries, go back to the, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason and whatever, whatever. We've tried it all. Despotic dictators, malevolent dictators, benevolent dictators, and, and monarchies of all shape, size, and form, constitutional, parliamentary, otherwise. We've done parliament, we've done you know, parliamentary democracy, we've done presidential democracy, we've done communism, fascism, socialism, it's all been tried. And I'm telling you, by far, and so uh, uh, there's a, you know, kind of privilege, if you will, of a few years under the belt. The, the, we really are the best opportunity. I believe in what we have. 
and so should you. But it won't work unless people vote and hold people in public life accountable, fight the corruption, shed light on the truth, and make it work. That's how it's going to happen. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate that. Thanks, man.